So today we are continuing on in the Apostle Paul and Silas's second, second missionary journey. And so we actually see him continue, go from more places to more places to preach and proclaim the gospel. Um, many people are concerned about Taylor Swift's next era's world tour stops. Today I'm here to instruct you on Paul's next world tour stops. And there are going to be four locations that we study and see this morning. Uh, the chapter 17, we're going to see three different places he goes to. First one's in Thessalonica. The second one, a brief little stop in Berea. He heads to Athens, and then we're going to Corinth. And even by the end of the passage, we see he leaves towards Ephesus for his third missionary journey. Uh, And so there will actually be a map up on the screen for you guys in a little bit to see what that looks like. But that's where we're going to be at today if you want to geographically understand where we're at. But the big, big thrust of our passage today is this accusation that gets charged against the Apostle Paul and Silas and the disciples early on in the chapter. They it told that they're turning the world upside down, that they're changing the world. And, and it's, it's interesting to me because I think all of us, to some degree, we have this desire within each and every one of us to make the world a better place, to change the world in which we live for the better, whether it's for ourselves, for our kids, for our grandkids, for just the human population at large. Even if you think back uh, to at the beginning of the school year, and there's all those cute kids standing with their signs like, today is the first day of X grade. When I grow up, I want to be X because I want to change the world in what way? You know, like, we have this inside of us, this desire to change the world for the better. We've seen songs like Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson when he said, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. See, I knew some of you guys knew Michael Jackson. I knew you guys can do that one. Um, Ben Harper told us he could change the world with his own two hands. John Mayer says he's waiting for the world to change. And Sam Cooke once saying, change is going to come. You and I often have the same desire to do the same things. And we have the same potential within us. But by surprising means by what we're going to study in the chapters of 17 and 18 today in the book of Acts. And so uh, my main idea is this as we walk through the passage. And it says this, or it's going to be this. The gospel turns the world upside down by turning it right side up. The gospel turns the world upside down by turning it right side up. So we're actually gonna see as we study these two chapters together, there's this reorientation, there's this work that's done within our lives, within our minds, within our hearts, that as we interact with Jesus, come to an understanding of who he is, what he's done and what he's accomplished for us, it takes this upside down world in which we live in and turns it right side up. Now, for those who don't believe and those who are far from God, they think we're turning it upside down for the worse, but we, as Christians, from our worldview, from our perspective, think we're actually helping right-size the world the right way as the way in which God intended and created it to be. So let me pray for our time, and we'll jump in. Father, we give you thanks for this morning, um, for the breath that's in our lungs, the opportunity that we've had to declare your goodness in song, the fact that we've been able to enjoy Uh, fellowship and relationship with one another during our our time of greeting and our time of walking in. And we pray that you would uh, just bless this time as we open your word. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear the truth of the scripture? Would you give us a heart and a soul to receive the truths that are in this? We pray that you would uh, prevent any distractions from coming in. And we ultimately ask that you would give us faith to believe that these things are true. We pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said... Amen. So you'll see up on the screen is a, a little bit of a roadmap of where uh, this secondary mission, secondary, second missionary journey took place for Paul and Silas. And so last week, Luke left us off in Philippi, uh, and then they end up traveling 100 miles west from Philippi down to a place called Thessalonica. And so we'll see them there for a little bit. They'll stop in Berea, head down to Athens, and we'll, we'll see where else he goes from there. And so this, obviously, ancient Greece, that time, uh, you'll notice some cities and some phrases that are recognizable if you studied world history at any time. And so Paul goes 100 miles from Philippi to Thessalonica, and this is where we pick up in chapter 17, and it says this. Uh, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks 
and not a few of the leading women. So upon first blush, as we read this first interaction of what's taking place in Thessalonica, is Paul and Silas are doing what Paul has been doing all along on these different missionary journeys. He comes to a new city, he goes to the synagogue, opens up the scriptures, and notice the five verbs that Luke uses to describe what he did in the synagogues. It says that he reasoned with them. He explained to them. He proved from the scriptures about who Jesus was, that Jesus had to suffer that death on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins to be made right with God. And he proclaimed that Christ actually did those things, but then he also proclaimed that Christ rose again from the dead three days later, defeating our biggest enemies of sin and death. And he proclaimed those things, and it also says, by his reasoning, by the way he spoke, the way he showed those things, he persuaded, helped people to see Christ is who he really is. So it's, it's important when we think about what we come to church for and what we gather for on Sunday mornings is not necessarily just a talk to entertain us or to soothe our consciences, but the role of the Sunday morning as we are gathered is, as Paul would have done, going to the synagogue to reason for those three Sabbath days, we do the same thing here on Sunday morning. That's what you should expect, and that's what you can come to anticipate on Sundays when you come here, is that we're each week going to reason and explain the scriptures and prove that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. And so this is what was Paul's pattern was, wanting to tell the people and show the people that Jesus is who he claims to be. He, he's God. He's the Savior of our souls. He's reigning and ruling. He, he lived a perfect life, one that we could not live. He, he performed many miracles to show that he's bringing in a new kingdom that's going to right-size the world unlike which we talked about. He, he would, Paul would have talked about and what we will talk about what Jesus is doing right now is he's reigning and ruling at the right hand of the Father. That's exactly what Paul did, setting the example for us, and what, that's why we gather the way that we do on Sunday's mornings. And what's fascinating about it is if, if we think about it, it just says that he was there for those three Sabbath days, and he spent time there, and he invested in those individuals for those three, those three Sabbath days, but it set something into motion that radically changed that city because in your New Testament, you can actually read two letters that Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, and the things that it says about the people there, that they're people full of faith, that they became models to follow after, and that their faith was well known, that they were a missionary church reaching people far from God telling people about God and seeing people come to faith. So even just from the short period of time that Paul spends there, he has a great impact and changes the dynamic and the makeup of that city. And, and we know from the passage as we, as, we, as we skip over a few verses that every single time that they would come to the synagogues and come to these places, some people would receive the message with faith and believe, and that would be great. But then some people would become jealous some people didn't like what was taking place and would then recruit a crowd along with them. And as the scripture calls them in this section, men of rabble, which sounds like a fantastic death metal band if you want to start one, men of rabble. They start this mob and pursue Paul and Silas and the other disciples and want to stop them. And so they go searching for them. They can't find them, and they come to a man named Jason's house, searching for them. They can't find them, and this is where we pick up in verse 6. It says, when they could not find them, meaning Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decree of Caesar, saying there is another king. Just notice what they were doing to be accused of turning the world upside down. They were preaching and proclaiming and telling people about Jesus. Simply by proclaiming and proving and persuading others that Jesus is real, they were turning the world upside down. They were upsetting the city. What a fascinating accusation was leveled against them. They're bringing about change to a world, right-sizing things, radically transforming people's lives, simply by preaching and proclaiming who Christ is. This is, I think, instructive for us to some degree because our world is already upset and upside down by sin. Our preaching, our proclaiming, our service, like Christ, turns the world upside down, right-siding it up. And I wish all of us would begin to see our role having an opportunity to upset the world in this way. 
Many of us might be accused of upsetting others, but maybe not for the right reasons, as which we see in this text here. But they were preaching, proclaiming, proving, persuading that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And again, notice what the people, the crowd says they were doing. They're proclaiming Christ as Savior and King. And so Thessalonica was this, this place that was, obvious, was often war-torn and different people claiming who was going to be leader, who was going to be king. And these individuals say that these men, these people who are preaching and proclaiming Christ, they're actually individuals who are committing treason, saying that there's somebody higher and above the Caesar. And it, 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 to one degree, I could see how that would be intimidating to think like, man, they're going to get in trouble. But at the same time, as the disciples, as Paul and Silas, and for us to think about it, what do they really have to fear? Because Caesar is just a small fry compared to the one true God, right? Empires and kings come and go, but Christ is eternally reigning and ruling. Think of it simplistically, if we were to invite an NFL team, whether it's the Seahawks or somebody else, to come play against your child's Pop Warner Pee Wee football team, they would not be very concerned and would probably wipe the floor with your children, but in a nice way because they are children, but they really wouldn't be all that concerned about beating them and winning, right? Because they, they're so much more prominent and stronger and faster, and they know how to play the game better. And so that, that's a very simplistic way for us to think about, like, how, why would Jesus even be concerned about Caesar? He's a man who will die. He's a man that will, doesn't actually have all authority and all power and all wisdom and knowledge, because that belongs solely to Christ. And so they bring this charge up against Paul and Silas, saying that they're turning the world upside down by preaching and proclaiming that message. The message of forgiveness of sins. The message of the reality that our sins can be forgiven. Knowing that as we believe that truth, it changes the way we see this world and how we operate within that world. Because that's the very first fundamental thing. If we're going to turn the world upside down, the right side up, we need to see ourselves as forgiven by God, our sins forgiven, and we're in right relationship with him. And from that truth alone, everything else changes. And that's what Paul and Silas were proclaiming. We can find forgiveness of sins, real relationship with God, because of what Christ has done for you on your behalf on the cross. People didn't like it then, and people won't like it today. And so this mob comes, tries to distract, destroy and they come to their senses, uh, meaning the disciples, and in verse 10 it says this. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived there, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So Paul and Silas caused this riot to break forth. The brothers of faith send them away about 50 miles west to Berea at night. And they do what they just did in Thessalonica. They go to the synagogue, but they have a different interaction there. They begin reasoning with the people. They begin showing and proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. And I love how this church is described. And for all eternity, the church in Berea is known as this. They receive the word with all eagerness examining the scripture daily to see if these things were so. So this eagerness speaks to not that they were naive or that they simply believed everything that they heard, but as Paul or the individuals would reason with them from the scriptures, they would have their, their, their scriptures, they would be, be considering these things, they'd be watching these things, wanting to see and have conversations, is this person just blowing smoke? Or is this person really just speaking the truth? I, I think about even what that means for us today on Sunday mornings. Of, do we come Sunday morning ready to hear from God, hoping that the scriptures would be expanded in such a way that we'd be able to examine them to see if these things were true? So I love it when I get to stand up here on Sunday morning and I see people with their scriptures open or, or they have their discipleship guide and they're taking notes because then later that week they're going to be studying it. It's like, was Kyle just full of it there or does he actually know what he's talking about there? We're st the jury's still out on that one. We're trying to figure this one out, but we're going to study this. We're going to figure this out. We're listening. We're going to engage in such a way so we can be just like the church in Berea. So there was this receptivity, this critical thinking that implies this judicial investigation as if you are on a court case trying to figure out if these things are true. So they're doing this, explaining the scriptures, the 
people are receiving it, but the men of rabble and the riots from Thessalonica make their way eventually to Berea, and they try and put a stop to Paul and Silas there. You have to be doing something really right for a mob to chase you down over 30 miles, right? So the result from this is they decide to send Paul down to Athens. Silas and some of the other disciples hang back. So Paul is sent down to Athens, and he's waiting in Athens for the rest of his team to catch up to him when this interaction happens, starting in chapter 17, verse 16. It says this. Now, while Paul was waiting in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So you'll see back up on the map, they were up in Berea. He comes about 300 miles south down to Athens, and he's waiting for his missionary team there to join him. And think about it, he's, he could have maybe taken the time to like, there's beautiful architecture in Athens, and maybe I'll go see the sites. It was the intellectual capital of the Roman Empire at the time, so much influence of the Greco-Roman history comes from there. Think of all the things he could have said. Like, maybe I'll go by the Parthenon to see just the beauty and marvel of those places. Maybe because it was a philosophical center, maybe he'll go and listen to somebody talk or see some types of things and interact just with what the, the city has to offer and enjoy it. But that's not what happens with Paul. He's there in Athens, and God stirs something up within him. Notice what again what it says in verse 16. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And so we see two things take place within Paul's heart here. For one, he has this righteous indignation or righteous anger that swells up within inside of him because he sees this city, this, the masses of this population, not worshiping the one true God, mocking him by worshiping other idols worshiping false gods, not giving him due credence and, and worship for what he deserves for being the one true God. So he, he, he sees this jealousy, wishing these people would come to see the one true God. Yet he doesn't get angry at them, he becomes heartbroken for them. That they would be so deceived, that they would be so twisted, that they would allow these lesser things to have such an influence in their life that they wouldn't be able to see and acknowledge God for who he really is. So that's what it's talking about when his spirit was provoked. He's, he's jealous for God's worship to be credited to him, but he's also heartbroken for all these people who are misled, led astray, settling for something less. He was motivated by a love for God and motivated by a love for his neighbor. And so Paul decides to speak out against the idols of the day. And for us, we, we can think it's almost primitive because we don't necessarily have statues of gods that we think that we worship. But, but there are different idols that we allow to take place and prominence within our hearts and within our minds. I mean, how much of us are driven by the approval of our peers and are willing to make sacrifices in our life because we want to get that person's approval? That's worshiping a false god. That's worshiping an idol. How much of us, our lives is a relentless pursuit of success or money or sex and pleasure or food? Or how much of our life is all consumed by a sports team, whether they win or when they lose? Maybe we've sacrificed everything in our life to pursue a certain education, or maybe we're just obsessed with a certain individual that what they say, what they do, we live and breathe and die upon. We may not have temples built for them in our lives, but they definitely have a place within our hearts and in our minds. And so Paul sees this taking place in Athens. His spirit is provoked, and he doesn't then just decide to go on this war path to be angry, to ridicule, to mock people for these things. But look at what he does in verse 17. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. You see, he was looking for an opportunity to connect with individuals and point their false worship and actually say, this thing that you're seeing, this thing that you're experiencing, there's something better for you. And Luke records for us some of the people that they're interacting with in verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoke philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul sees this as an opportunity to be a faithful witness where God has led him to be to show people who God truly is. 
what God is really like. So he goes to the synagogue, as was his practice, and when the synagogue wasn't open, he's going to the marketplace. He's trying to interact with as many people to be a faithful witness and help people have their world turned upside down, the right side up. And so Luke lays out for us in this, there's two prominent world's ways of thinking, the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans would believe that there's nothing happens when you're dead. It just kind of cease to exist. There's no suffering, there's no torment pure materialists that were seeking comfort and pleasure. If it felt good, they encouraged you to do it. They wanted you to enjoy pleasure. They were the original Yoloians. You only live once. That's what they taught. Well, that's what they believed, and that's what they wanted you to do. Well, the Stoics, on the other side, understood that there was an immortality of the soul, but it was more of a bodiless existence once we cease to exist on this world. That the divine was immersed in everything it was quite fatalistic and encouraged people just to grit through it, grin it, and bear it. So Paul is interacting with these different inter- these individuals trying to point to them that there's folly in both of those ways of thinking. And then notice what it says in verse 19. So far he'd gone to the synagogues on his own volition and he went to the marketplace on his own volition. But in verse 19 it says, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. So he was actually almost arrested and seized and brought here. I know oftentimes when we think about this scene when Paul goes to Mars Hill that he kind of walked in trying to impress all these philosophers and all these thinkers. But the reality is that as he was preaching this foreign divinity, he was actually kind of called to a tribunal. See, this is similar to what would have happened to our good friend Socrates or our friend Bill and Ted would say, Socrates. Excellent. Be excellent to each other. That's what Socrates was essentially put to death for when he was brought forward because he was preaching a foreign divinity. So this is much similar to what others have faced before and faced great trouble. And so they brought him forward in verse 19, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and all the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. It's, it's, it's fascinating how this, this book can be written thousands of years ago, but there's a verse that seems so poignant for our times. Verse 21. Many of us live and spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. We just always want to mask. We want to learn more. Tell me, show, show me something shiny. Show me something new. We're not that much different than them. So Paul, seizing this opportunity as he is seized, stood in the midst and said, Men of Athens... I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So as Paul is walking around Athens, he has this cultural awareness about him to see what is taking place in the society and in the town in which he was in. So as he's, he would have walked the streets of Athens, he would have seen these different temples or these different statues that would be attributed to these different false gods or these idols that people would worship, and they would do different things. And he says, you have one in your city, you have one in your place that says, to the unknown God. Well, let me tell you about who this unknown God is. And so Paul starts, before he even begins to teach them Jesus and show them Jesus, he starts on a common ground, something that they would have been familiar with. Hey, I noticed in your town you have this thing, the unknown God. Can I tell you about him? Because I know him. I know truth about him, and I want to to share share this with you. So Paul, Paul notices that there's this openness to spirituality, and he even affirms some of the things that they think and believe, but then he begins to right size it up. He takes their upside down world, and he begins to right size it. And so this is very similar to what we saw him do in Thessalonica, as he did with the scriptures but he takes things within the culture that the people in Athens would have known and does the same thing. He says in verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, although he needs anything. Since he always gives himself to all mankind, life and breath and everything, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek him 
and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we not ought to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So he's been walking around in Athens. He's been having these different conversations, having these different interactions, and he gets this opportunity to speak, and he begins to take their belief systems to task to show that what you actually think pales in comparison to the unknown God that you don't know. Because he first lays out for them that the God that they do not know, that he's trying to show to them, to reveal to them, is actually the creator of the universe, as you saw in verse 24. You see, the Epicureans at the time thought everything just happened by chance. The Stoics thought God was in all of it. But Paul presents the one true God saying that he is the creator and Lord over all. He cannot and is not going to be contained by temples built by human hands. He then even goes on to say that this God is actually the one sustaining of life. You don't actually serve him to keep him going. He's the one who provides for you in your time of needs. You see, Paul kind of takes them to task a little bit because they almost as if had all their gods as like little pets within their house. One commentator on this passage says, any attempt to domesticate or reduce our God to a household pet for food or shelter dependent upon us is a ridiculous reversal of roles. And I think sometimes we sometimes do that. We just keep our God safe, on a leash, domesticated, Therefore, our comfort, dependent upon us, needing us. But the one true God's not like that at all. We rely upon him. Paul says this God is the ruler of all nations. In verse 26, that he has appointed the times and places in which we live. Have you ever thought about that? That where, where you live today, the time and place in human history that you live, was not by mistake, and it was not by accident. The fact that you are alive in 2023, almost 2024, in Vancouver, Washington, Southwest Washington, Pacific Northwest, the United States, all those things, it is not by accident. It is not by chance. God has allotted the boundaries, the times, and the places in which you will live, and the fact that you are here today is not by accident. So Paul's saying here, that he's appointed the times in which places in which you live, and there's a reason for that as he goes on. He says that God is the Father in verse 28. Paul utilizes modern poetry of the, or the poetry of their time to tease people and bring them into understanding of who God is. And then he concludes his speech by saying that God is the judge of all and ultimately will render, we will all render an account to him that will have eternal ramifications. But the way that he teases this out, and I think it's important for us to realize and think about today, is that he says, if he's appointed the times and the places in which we live, it says in there that he's done it for a reason so that people might feel their way towards him. I love that, how it says that. Having a determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Why? Verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. If you've ever traveled to maybe a family member's house or you've gotten a hotel or gone to an Airbnb or maybe even in your own house, you've fallen victim to this. It's pitch dark. You walk into a room and you know on this wall there should be a light switch there, right? But it's never right where you first find it. You like blast the wall in search of the light switch to turn on the light. Has anybody ever done that? I mean, I, I did that this morning as I was getting ready. It was dark in my room. I, I put something on my bed and I, was, I couldn't find it. I knew it was there. I sensed it there. And so I'm just like patting the bed, going crazy. My wife's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm looking for my phone. I know it's here somewhere. I can sense it. Part of it is because I knew I just put it there. 
But what, what Paul is saying is that the places in which we live, the boundaries in which we are at, the places that we come to encounter is that, that we would begin to feel and search and find God almost as if we're trying to turn on the light switch, like where is the light, where is the light, where is the light? That we would seek and sense and find our way towards him. The beautiful thing that we have opportunity to do, some of you church, is that we know where the light switch is as people are padding around in the dark. God has not only appointed the times and places in which you live so that you may find him, but that also you may help others find him. So I encourage you this morning to go turn on the light for someone. They're padding around in the dark, searching and looking and trying to find God. You know exactly where he is. You can bring him there. And so Paul appeals to their intellect and he appeals to what they worship and he appeals to what they know and he, he tries to bring them to a point of faith and as we see it, in this interaction, some people receive it. Some people reject it and mock it because of the resurrection. How could somebody truly rise from the dead? And that's that kind of how the interaction ends for Paul up on, up on Mars Hill. So he's there, and in verse, or chapter 18, it, it tells us that Paul left Athens to go to Corinth. And so we see that in 18, verse 1. We don't have time to go through all of chapter 18 today. I encourage you guys to, in your life groups this week, your men's groups, your women's groups, or even just in your personal study, explore some of the things in chapter 18. But you'll see that Paul travels about 75 miles west from Athens to Corinth. And at this point, he's been on journey for quite some time. And as you read chapter 18, you'll see that he seems to be a little bit discouraged towards the beginning of the chapter. Money's tight. There's been relational tension. He's been ran out of cities. He's been arrested. He's been seized. And he comes to a city of Corinth that is extremely twisted, extremely dark, and extremely challenging. And I could see them almost getting towards the end of his rope, but God gives him this beautiful vision in here to help him keep going. Because at this point, Paul's traveled about 2,000 miles by foot and about 1,000 miles by boat. So if you were to think about it, if I were to send you on a preaching thing, walking 2,000 miles, talking to people about Jesus, you would get to about Milwaukee or Chicago. This is what Paul's been doing, simply to tell people and point people to Christ. And he finds himself at Corinth, a city that was known to be extremely corrupt, big commerce city, had very misskewed, misunderstanding and skewed views of sexuality. There's thousands upon ten thousands of temple prostitutes. It was an extremely dark, twisted city. If you read the book of First and Second Corinthians, you kind of get a glimpse of what was going on there, what the people were dealing with. And so Paul comes to the city, and I could see him just feeling almost a sense of being overwhelmed. Here's why I am. Here's what's been going on. I don't know how I can keep going. But Paul receives this vision from God that is an encouragement for us today as well. Verse 9, it says this. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, don't be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So this isn't too far removed from that broken and righteous heart that he had earlier. He has his heart towards the lost, but he sees a vision that God has not yet done saving people. Do you think about that as you interact in your neighborhood, as you drive towards your workplace, as you interact with other mortals, human beings, as you go to the ball field as your kid is on track or in, in softball or basketball, that there are many people that are God's people and don't know it yet. Every single place you will go to later today, all throughout this week, you're going to see and interact with people who are God's people that don't know it yet. And he sent us there to reach them. This is such a challenging and convicting thought for us to think about it because oftentimes, think about it, if, if, if Corinth existed today, I can only imagine the news cycles that it would be consumed in on television, much like how Portland gets covered or how Seattle gets covered, San Francisco, New York, all these different types of things. Corinth would have been that type of city that would have gotten round-the-clock news coverage of how corrupt, how broken, how gross, how disgusting it is. 
And yet, God leads Paul there to say, I have many people there. Don't be silent. Keep preaching. Keep teaching. Keep reaching. I have many people that are there that are mine. How, how challenging should that be to us today, even as we think about just the different interactions that we have or the different conversations that we have, even just about our brothers and sisters that don't know it yet across the river? How we're so quickly to write off our neighbors. There's no more God-fearing people around here. Yes, there is. There's many people in the city who are his. I can't help but think about this all the time as I'm walking my neighborhood, whether with my family or with my dog or by myself, that there are people in my neighborhood. Knowing what Paul taught in, in Athens, that he's appointed the times and places in which I would live, and that now he's got people in the city that are ready to be his, that means every single where I go, there's somebody who doesn't know him yet that's his. Do we believe that? Even just think about we have Fall Fest coming up at the end of the month, and I think it's so funny to me that people bought really nice houses out here not realizing that they were going to be next door to a church. That's not by accident. He sent them here for us to reach them. He has many people in this city who are his. Would you please go turn on the light switch for them? So we see this interaction take place in Corinth that God gives this encouragement to Paul. If we jump back up to the chapter, verse 2, he comes into interaction with some fellow disciples that are going to be influential for the early church. In verse 2 it says, Paul found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. So we see this interaction take place. Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila, people that we'll know and see from here on out in the book of Acts and different parts of the New Testament. And there's this affinity between them, not simply because they're also uh, fellow disciples, but they also share a trade with Paul. And so they have these interactions and Paul disciples and cares for them. And what's cool to see is that not even by the end of the chapter, this discipleship relationship that Paul has developed with Priscilla and Aquila, they themselves see themselves as participants in discipleship, not just as recipients, but ones who who disciple others as well. And so throughout 18, we see this relationship formed with them. Eventually, Priscilla, Aquila, Paul, and others go to Ephesus, and we see at the end of the chapter, verse 24, this interaction take place in Ephesus. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus, and he was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and been fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in a synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So I love this. Even at the beginning of the chapter, in chapter 18, verse 2, we see Priscilla and Aquila introduced to us and Paul. They have this relationship. They learn. They grow together. They go to a different place together. And as they're sitting in a synagogue hearing somebody else preach and teach, they're like, he's missing something. They didn't stand up and ridicule him. They didn't stand up and mock him. They didn't belittle him. They pulled this man aside, Apollos, and began to disciple him and instruct him in the scriptures to help him get a further understanding of truly who Jesus is. So we see this, this tributary of discipleship take place of Paul starting, investing in Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila seeing that this is our job too. And then they see this young man preaching and teaching that needs a little bit of help. They bring, them on, bring him under their wing and explain the scriptures to him a little bit more. And notice what it says about him later on in verse 27. When he wished to across to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he was powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So this man, Apollos, who, who needed some training, he needed just some discipleship, was invested in and essentially sent back to Corinth and helped plant churches alongside Paul there. In fact, if you're familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll recognize the name of Paulus when, when Paul's talking about it. He's like, I don't really care how the church got started. I don't care who gets the credit. Maybe I planted, Apollos watered, vice versa. It's ultimately God who gets the glory for the growth that takes place. And so we see this engagement and discipleship of helping people go from an upside-down world to a right-sided-up world. 
And so as, we, as we've walked through chapter 17 and 18, we've seen a lot and explored a lot. And as we said earlier, there's, there's an opportunity for us to do the same type of work of not only having our worlds turned right side up, but also helping others turn their world upside down to the right side up. And there were seven things that the Apostle Paul and the other disciples did that were extremely simple that had a radical impact on that Greco-Roman world. And those things are going to be up on the screen for you. And so 17 and 18 shows us a world turned right side up by Jesus, and it includes these things. All things that you and I could engage in this week and begin to change the world around us. The first one is, as we saw Paul doing within the synagogues with the scriptures, he was proclaiming Christ as Savior and King. There is no other name under heaven which man and woman can be saved but in Christ Jesus. There is no one else worthy of our, of our loyalty and our allegiance and our worship but King Jesus. We can explore and examine the scriptures together week in and week out, not just here on Sunday morning when we gather, but also throughout the week in our groups, our own personal study and our own devotions, that we would explore and examine the scriptures to gain a better understanding of who God is. We can pray that God would give us a righteous and a broken heart for the people around us. Now, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I've been challenged by and impressed by in this past season as we've been studying the book of Acts. It almost feels like we're becoming a broken record to some degree. Like, all right, guys, they went into a city filled with people who didn't know them. They preached Jesus. People believed. See you next week. We're going to tell you the same thing again. But to some degree, I think that needs to be instructive and informative to us that God would hopefully break our heart to a point to where we have that compassion that Paul had as he walked around Athens. That he'd be so discontent with people not knowing the one true God that he was so heartbroken with them, not angry at them, but heartbroken that they didn't know that God loves them, that God forgives them, that God is ready to receive them upon repentance. I've been praying that God would give us that righteous and broken heart. Pray that we could be faithful witnesses where God places us. You will go to places that only you go in our church. You're the only one, maybe, you might have some coworkers that go to this church, but oftentimes you might be one of the only ones at your workplaces that knows Christ and God is calling you to be a faithful witness there. We can understand just culturally what's going on, being able to engage with people, knowing what their proclivities are, as we saw Paul with the men in Athens. We could have a god side vision, believing that God has not yet done saving people around us. We can engage in discipleship, help others understand, be taught the scriptures, and begin to show others and teach others the scriptures as well. This is an extremely simplistic way of viewing 17 and 18, but I think it's a helpful and appropriate way for us to consider just where God has placed us. Again, if he's appointed the times and places in which we'd live, he's appointed the times in which we would be studying this passage as well. I think there's something for all of us in there. So as we go this week, as we can reflect upon who God is and what he's done for us, could we begin to live in a world right-sided by Jesus, showing everybody else how to get there, how to come to an experience with God and help others turn their world upside down, but ultimately right-siding their world? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today that as we consider Acts 17 and 18, I, I just love the fact that you, you send your people to be on mission for you to, to encounter you in new and difficult and trying ways, but also to encounter you on the mission field that people would see those far from you come to faith. Father, it's still, it's still crazy to me that you would entrust this message to people like us who are faulty. That you would entrust this message to human beings who often want to worship other things other than you. But God, we pray this morning that as we 
maybe consider the truths of the scripture this morning that would you reveal to us where we are living in the upside down world, not in the way in which you would intend for us. We pray that you would help us to examine and explore the scriptures and see truth in them. Would you give us a heart that is broken for the the world around us? Would you give us boldness to be a faithful witness where you send us? Would you help us to believe that you're not done saving people yet? That we have neighbors, that we have coworkers, we have acquaintances that we run into casually for the sake of helping them seek and feel their way towards you. Would you make those divine appointments abundantly clear in our lives and in our calendars this week, wherever we go? And help us to believe that your spirit will lead us as we have those conversations. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.